Boss, the nature of the human person, uh, mind, consciousness has been a, a lifelong focus and passion of mine from my doctorate in neuroscience to continuing thinking about it. And I'm always looking for new ways of approaching what to me is, is, is certainly an unsolved problem and maybe an unsolvable problem. Mm -hmm. And I am really fascinated because in the little I've seen, you have a fairly radically different approach to anything I've seen. And I've seen a lot in terms of trying to understand what's the self. So I'm open ears to, to learn. Well, first of all, I want to bring the question down to earth. I mean, what is the self is an abstract question, uh, but it's, uh, it's just the abstract form of what am I? What am I? And I would insist on asking this, this question in the first person. Okay. Um, you know, it's um, an impersonal answer like I'm a rational animal, I'm a, I'm a featherless biped, and so it's <laughs> not going to uh, satisfy me. But if I insist on asking in the first person, first person language is logically very interesting. It has, the question involves self-reference. Mm -hmm. And so the answer will have to involve self-reference. Now, self-reference became a big topic in logic and foundations of yes. mathematics. Right. And I became convinced that the limited of theory, theorems there uh, are really crucial to the question, what am I? Because, or rather to the question of how this could be answered. So that's Gödel's theorem? Yes. The incompleteness of mathematics? Right. Um, so on the surface, it sounds like it has nothing to do with the Exactly. Self. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I used to edit philosophy journals, and if something came in about Gödel's theorem, I thought, probably a crank. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> but when Gödel was doing this work, he was developing something in order to prove the theorem. Um, he developed a way of looking at the language of mathematics with a, with a coding key, so that the... Um, things that look like just you know, 2 plus 3 equals 5 and so on are now read as a code for something else. And when the code is set up, he can simulate self-reference. And that was the key to proving his theorem. Uh -huh, sure. And then it became the key to proving other theorems, uh, what we call limitative theorems, you know, paradox yeah, kinds yeah. of theorems. Uh -huh. And um, what uh, the conclusion that I, I draw when I work on that, and, and I, I did in this together with Richmond Thomason, who has a, a wonderful insight in this, is there is no possibility of an adequate answer to what am I, uh, of an ad by adequate I mean a complete answer. Because of the self-reference. Exactly. Which is, a, which is the analogy to Gödel's theorem. Exactly. Okay. So that, the, in putting it abstractly, the self transcends any possible description, that you can make better and better descriptions uh, but it is impossible to get catch. all the way there. <laughs> exactly. Right. So what are the implications of that? Well, um, well, the first implication is we can't have an adequate answer. Oh, okay. Right? We cannot have an adequate conception of ourselves. But then the second thing is surely we can have better and worse partial, yeah. right? And so um, we can t think about answers that people try to give. Like, um, I think that the, the worst one is the physicalist answer. You know, I'm my body. Um, in nature, there's no demarcation between my body and the rest of nature. Uh, this is constant exchange of uh, energy, yeah, water. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, we need a whole ecosystem to exist at all. In nature, there is no such principle demarcation of, of, of me or you. And uh, in, um, in our society, the medical profession, the legal profession will give definitions, but these are contextual, conventional, right? So I think that, uh, logically speaking, there is no identification uh, of a particular body with me, um, but, um, or phenomenologically either. Yeah, and, and, and even if, if you could argue that, the body itself to me is not going to be a self. I mean, right. Yeah, you know, we wouldn't say a dead body is a self, et cetera. So, mm, so I right. uh, agree. So, all right. Yeah. Now so I want, to go, I want to go farther. So I want to give a positive answer. Yeah. Uh, and I take my, my cue, first of all, from Wittgenstein. Uh, I'm not a thing, but I'm not nothing. Uh, I'm not a thing, but I'm not nothing. I'm not a thing at all. Uh, now, the material world is made up of things, um, material things. So if I'm not a thing, then I'm not a material thing, but I exist. Wait a minute, you're not a thing because you're not a material thing, or you're not a material thing because you're not a thing? I mean, you... The second. The second, I'm, I'm not a thing, period. 
how, how do you make that assertion? Yeah. You see, at first it looks like it is logically uh, a contradiction to yeah. say I'm not a thing but not nothing. Right. But actually, if we follow it up in logic, it is perfectly consistent. Okay. Um, and uh, I would give you another example. You know, we say we have the word everything, right? The way the logician will treat everything is that normally it refers to a set of things, yeah. you know, maybe just you and me or... Every member of the set. Every member of the set, right. But there's no set of everything. So that's the paradox. Yeah. That's the paradox. It's, it's, a, it's a logical impossibility. Yeah, right, right. So if by the totality of everything, if by the world we mean the totality of everything, it's not a thing. Okay. It's not a thing. Okay. Right? Okay. Um, so logically speaking, this is a possible position. So, but that's of the whole world. There's not a set of every, every single set. Mm. But how does that apply to I am not a thing? I am not a thing. So that's, no, I'm not saying I, can, I will demonstrate this. I'm saying this is the position I offer. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. I'm not a thing, but I'm not nothing. Okay. So then if there's no identification with a the thing, there's nevertheless all the relations that define my place in oh, the world, oh, okay. I say, and my body, my toes, my hands, yeah. uh, my car, you know, and phenomenologically, um, I, for, if I, for example, if I were, this is just some quick examples now, right? Um, on my way to the airport, as I was driving, I made a mistake and I hit the curb. Did I hit the curb? At that yeah, point, I'm yeah. thinking of myself and the car right, as one, right. unit, yeah, one unit, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. So I would say I manifest analogy. myself in the world that's through good, my relation to all these different things. And that's a good analogy. I like yes. that. I like that yeah. because at that point, you know, you yeah. did. You're not going to blame the car. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's it's your extension. Now I think that um, um, this idea that the relations are real, but there's no thing at the at the bottom, is a sort of sort of idea that. Uh, people who study quantum mechanics, and especially the Heisenberg interpretation... Would feel very comfortable. Are, are going to be comfortable <laughs> with, exactly. Not, not, not totally, yeah, right, but, you right, know, right. you're not going to say it's absurd, you see? Yeah, right, right. Uh, but it is strange. Yeah. I know that. So I would say, well, here's a different kind of analogy, not to the electron, but to the, to the pagan deities who, mm. well, to Krishna, for example. Mm. Um, he manifests himself in the world. He is in the world, but not of the world, yeah. right? I think maybe that's what we are like. Oh. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think that we are like minor deities in that respect. <laughs> we, we manifest ourselves through our relations to everything else, but there's no thing, but I'm not nothing. That's a very quick <laughs> summary about it. Um, it's the idea of the transcendence of the ego, that the ego transcends every possible representation of of the ego.